Welcome, my friends and seekers, to the Gospels Inc. podcast, where ink meets inspiration and stories of faith come to life. I'm your host, David Green, and while I'm not a preacher, I'm here to guide you on a refreshing journey through the pages of hope and salvation. Each week, we delve into different chapters of the Bible, unpacking wisdom, uncovering the truths, and exploring the life-changing message within. Together, we'll navigate the rich mosaic of God's Word, allowing it to illuminate your past, enrich your spirits, and deepen our understanding of faith and life. Imagine navigating the complexities of life with the Bible as your compass, painting each day with strokes of grace, love, and truth. Here at Gospel Inc., that's not just a dream, it's our shared journey. So why wait? Embark on this aligning adventure with us. Let your spirit be stirred and your heart be filled with the warmth of the ultimate truth. Stay tuned and stay blessed as we unfold vibrant hues of the gospel, only here in Gospel Inc. Welcome, dear listeners, to the Gospel Inc. podcast. As we close our exploration of Revelations, let's reflect on the vast expanse of the Bible, from the poetic beauty of the Psalms to the profound teachings of the Gospels. There lies a book that equally intrigued and mystified believers for centuries, the book of Revelations. Today, we delve into the final chapter of this book. Imagine, if you will, a grand cinematic conclusion to an epic saga. Revelations is the crescendo of the biblical narrative, the grand finale that brings God's story full circle. As we open its pages, we're invited into a world of vivid imagery, divine mysteries, and profound promises. It's a tapestry woven with threads of hope, of judgment, of redemption, and ultimately of triumphant over good over evil. In this episode, we explore the profound messages embedded in Revelations 22, and by extension, the entire book. We'll unearth the inspirations, heed the warnings, and find ourselves in awe of the magnificent tapestry that God has woven throughout history. So, whether you're a longtime student of the Word or just beginning to explore the riches of Revelations, I invite you to journey with us. Let's open our hearts and minds to the powerful messages that await. Grab your Bibles, take a deep breath. And let's embark on the final exploration of Revelations together, right here and only on Gospel Inc. First, we're going to start in verses 1 through 5. It's the river of life and the coming of Christ. Here's what it says. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there anymore. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and there will be no more night. They need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. So what we see here is the life-giving waters, the river of the water of life, shimmering as crystal, emanates from the very throne of God and the Lamb. This river symbolizes the continuous, life-sustaining blessings that flow from God's presence, bringing vitality and purity wherever it flows. Then we see the tree of everlasting life. On both sides of the river stands the tree of life. Unlike the tree in the Garden of Eden, which was a singular point of access to eternal life, the tree flourishes everywhere providing fruit and leaves for nourishment and healing. Its 12 kinds of fruit signify the completeness and abundance of life in God's presence. Then we see the eternal worship and intimacy. In the celestial city, all forms of curses and darkness are forever abolished. God's throne resides in this place, allowing his servants to continually worship him. The privilege of seeing his face and having his name on their foreheads signifies an intimate relationship with the Almighty. Then we see the perpetual day. In this heavenly realm, the, you know, the day and night cease to exist. God himself illuminates this place, rendering the need for any other source of light obsolete. The eternal day symbolizes the everlasting nature of God's glory. So here are my takeaways. Endless blessings. The river of life paints a picture of the consistent and never-ending blessing from God. It serves as a reminder that in his presence, there is an abundance of life, joy, and purity. Then we see the restored relationship. We can have hope in this restored relationship. The tree of life offers not just physical nourishment, but also spiritual restoration. The leaves for the healing of the nation emphasizes God's intention to heal and unite all of humanity under his love. And then what we can hope for is answered. Deep in intimacy with God. The ability to see God's face signifies a level of closeness and intimacy that was previously unattainable. 
in the eternal realm, we will experience an unobstructed relationship with our creator. And finally, we can rest in eternal glory. The absence of the night and the continuous reign of God's light underscores the eternal nature of his kingdom and the perpetual glory that his children will bask in. So to summarize this message found in verses 1 through 5, the depiction of the river of life and the tree of life in the New Jerusalem underscores the fullness of life, healing, and blessings in God's presence. The eternal day, where God himself is a source of light, reaffirms the never-ending glory and splendor of his kingdom. For believers, this vision serves as a beacon of hope and an assurance of the unparalleled joy and peace that awaits in God's eternal kingdom. Next, we're going to go to the verses that I titled The Assurance of Christ's Return, Revelations uh, chapter 22, verses 6 through 7. Here's what it says. And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true, for the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. See, I am coming. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. So what we can see here, right, is obviously trustworthy trustworthy testimony. The angel declares the trustworthiness and the veracity of the prophetic words. This assurance is not just based on the message itself, but also on the supreme authority of its source, the Lord, the God of the spirits and of the prophets. The same God who inspired prophets of old is now affirming the imminent fulfillment of these prophecies. Then we see Christ's affirmation. The words shift from the angel's declaration to Christ's own pronouncements. I am coming soon. This is a resounding affirmation from Christ himself, emphasizing the nearness of his return. His coming is not a distant event, but a looming reality. Then we can see blessedness and obedience. Christ pronounces a blessing on those who heed and obey the words of the prophecy contained in the book of Revelations. The blessing isn't just for the mere knowledge of the words, but in living them out. Underline the importance of active faith. So here are my takeaways. Unwavering reliability in the words of God. In a world filled with uncertainty and ever-changing truths, God's word stands firm and reliable. The assurance from the angel and Christ himself serves as a reminder that God's promises are steadfast and will surely come to pass. Next, there's an active participation component. Christ's impending return serves as a call for believers to live in a state of readiness. The phrase, I am coming soon, should not only inspire hope, but also galvanize into living lives reflective of his teachings. And lastly, my last takeaway, right? We need to be living by the word. The blessing extended to those who keep the words of the prophecy underscores the significance of not just hearing, but also applying God's work in daily life. It's a call to both internalize and externalize the teachings of the scripture. To summarize, verses 6 through 7, the pending return of Christ is emphasized with utmost assurance. As believers, we are called not only to anticipate his return, but also to live our lives in alignment with the truths and prophecies of the scripture. The promise of a blessing for obedience serves as both an encouragement and a gentle reminder of the importance of active faith in our journey with God. Next, we're going to move down to verses 8 through 9, the response to the vision and the angel's reprimand. Here's what it says. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I had heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of an angel who had shown them to me. But he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. What we see here is a witness of the vision. As previously mentioned, John asserts his role as the first-hand witness to the revelations. This statement ensures the authenticity of his account and serves as a testament to the events he described. Then what you see is John overwhelmed by the revelation. The magnitude of the vision leads John to a profound state of reverence, causing him to fall down and worship the angel who conveyed the revelations. This response showcases the immense impact and depth of the visions he received. But what we see next is the reprimand and clarity. The angel, however, swiftly corrects and misdirects or redirects John's worship. He emphasizes that he is merely a fellow servant on the same plane as John and the other prophets. The angel redirects the worship to the rightful recipient, God. This correction underlines the principle that worship is reserved solely for God. So here's my takeaway. Authentic testimony. John's role as a direct witness to the revelations reinforces the authenticity and reliability of the prophetic account in the book of Revelation. 
Next, we see natural human impulses. John's initial act of falling at the feet of an angel reflects a natural human impulse to show reverence when overwhelmed by divine manifestations. However, this act also serves as a reminder for believers to discern the focus of their worship. Lastly, guidance to right worship. The angel's reprimand and subsequent redirection are not just corrections, but profound lessons in humility and rightful worship. Even celestial beings in their grandeur and splendor acknowledge the supremacy of God and redirect all adorations towards him. To summarize the message in Revelations chapter 22, verses 8 through 9, John's personal testimony offers an authentic account of divine revelations, while his act of worship and the angel's correction provide a powerful lesson on rightful worship. As believers, it is crucial to direct our adoration, gratitude, and reverence solely to God, ensuring that our focus remains on the divine, irrespective of the marvels we witness or experience. Next, we're going to move down to verses 10 through 11, the command to proclaim and the finality of one state. Here is what it says. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. What we hear is the proclamation of prophecy, right? The angel commands John not to seal or conceal the words of the prophecy. Contrary to some of other biblical instructions where prophecies were sealed for a future time, here the urgency is powerful. The message is to be proclaimed because the time is near. This indicates the imminent nature of the events foretold and the urgency in making the revelations known. Then we see the finality of one state. The subsequent verse gives a somewhat ignamic command, suggesting the people's state of being will solidify as then approaches. Those entrenched in wickedness will continue in their ways, while the righteous will persist to be righteous. It hints at a point of no return, where choices become final and determines one's eternal destiny. So here's my takeaways. The urgency of the message. The directive not to seal up the prophecy underscores the critical importance of making God's revelation known. As believers, it serves as a reminder of our role in sharing the gospel and God's prophetic words, especially given the brevity of time. Then the consequences of choices, right? The depiction of the evildoer and the righteous in their respective paths is a stark reminder of the long-term consequences of our choices. It emphasizes the need for discernment and righteous living, especially when there's a clear understanding that actions have eternal implications. And then character, right? The delineation between the wicked and the righteous, especially as the end times approach, highlights the concept that character, once solidified, may become unstoppable. It's a call to self-reflection and push towards God's seeking grace and transform before it is too late. Before you are wicked and become wicked and stay wicked, you need to get right with God. So to summarize the message, right, found in verses 10 through 11, the unsealed nature of the prophecy emphasizes the nearness of God's final plans and the importance of readiness. Concurrently, the distinction between persistent paths of the wicked and the righteous offers a sobering perspective on the permanence of one's moral and spiritual choices. For believers, these verses reinforce the importance of living righteously, continuously seeking God's transformative grace, and sharing the message of salvation with urgency. Next, we're going to go down to verses 12 through 13. I titled this, The Promise of Christ's Return and His Eternal Nature. Here's what it says. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my rep recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. What we once again see here is the imminent return. The proclamation, I am coming soon, reiterates the nearness of Christ's return. This repetition emphasizes the urgency and the importance of the events God's uh, redemptive plan. And then just recompense. Christ's declaration that he will bring his recompense highlights the notion of divine justice. Every individual, great or small, will be repaid according to their deeds, underscoring the ideal of individual accountability before God. And then we see the eternal nature of Christ by identifying himself as the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Christ declares this, his eternal nature and sovereignty over all creation. These titles not only convey his timelessness, but also his supreme authority over all things from the inception to the culmination. So here are my takeaways. Living in expectation. 
the reiterated promise of Christ's imminent return serves as a reminder for believers to live in a state of constant readiness and expectation. This anticipation should inspire both hope and an active commitment to God's will. Secondly, we have accountability before God. The promise of recompense, based on one's deeds, highlights the principle that our choices and actions in this life have eternal consequences. It underscores the importance of living righteously and in alignment with God's commandments. And lastly, the reverence for Christ's sovereignty. Recognizing Christ as the beginning and the end, the eternal and unchanging one, should lead believers into a deeper reverence for him. This acknowledgement emphasizes not only his eternal nature, but also his central role in God's redemptive plan. To summarize this message, right, found in verses 12 through 13, Christ's impending return, accompanied by divine justice, offers both a promise of hope and a solemn reminder of accountability. The declaration of his eternal return reinforces his supreme authority and central role in the entirety of creation and redemption. For believers, these verses encourage, encourages uh, vigilant living, a pursuit of righteousness, and a profound reverence for the eternal Christ. Next, we're going to go down to verses 14 through 15. The blessed and the excluded. Here's what it says. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the adulterers, and everyone else who loves and practices falsehood. So we see here are the blessed. Those who wash their robes are granted privilege of accessing the tree of life and entering the heavenly city. The washing signifies purification, possibly alluding to the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm going to correct myself. Not possibly. That's what it is. Which offers forgiveness and reconciliation with God. This metaphor underlines the importance of sanctification and living a life in alignment with God's will. Then we see the excluded. The verses clearly demark those who are excluded from the blessings of the heavenly city. This list encompasses various forms of sin, emphasizing not just the acts themselves, but also the heart condition. Everyone who loves and practices falsehood. This is a solemn reminder that persistent rebellion against God and refusal to repent have eternal consequences. So here are my takeaways, right? The power of redemption. The act of washing one's robe can be seen as a beautiful representation of redemption through Christ. It serves as a reminder of the transformative power of God's grace and signifies uh, the seeking of forgiveness and sanctification and clear moral boundaries. The distinct categories of those blessed and those excluded underscore the clear moral boundaries set by God. It's a reminder that God's standards are unchanging, and there is a clear distinction between righteousness and wickedness in his eyes. And then the urgency of repentance. The exclusion of those who persistently engage in and love falsehood emphasizes the gravity of the unrepented sin. It serves as a stark reminder of the importance of genuine repentance and the dire consequences of persisting in rebellion against God. To summarize the message found in verses 14 through 15, the dichotomy between the blessed and the excluded offers a de clear depiction of God's justice and the consequences of one's choices. The blessedness of those who wash their robes serves as an encouragement to embrace God's offer of redemption, while the fate of the excluded serves as a warning against complacency and sin. For believers, these verses emphasize the importance of continual spiritual cleansing, righteous living, and the urgency of sharing the message of salvation with others. Next, we're going to move down to verses 16 through 17, the affirmation of Christ's identity and the invitation to all. Here's what it says. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty say, come, and let the one who desires take the water of life without price say, come. So what we see here is Jesus' affirmation. Jesus personally affirms his identity and the authenticity of Revelation's message. By identifying himself as both the root and the descendant of David, he emphasizes his eternal nature and rightful lineage from David. Additionally, as the bright morning star, he is depicted as a harbinger of a new day, offering hope and guidance. Then we see the universal invitation. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the bride, the church, unite in extending an invitation to all emphasizing the collaboration effort in God's redemptive plan. This call is not exclusive. It's open to everyone who hears and desires to partake. 
And lastly, we see the gift of eternal life, the water of life, symbolizing the eternal life and salvation offered by Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Remarkably, this gift is extended without a price, highlighting the grace of God and the unmerited nature of salvation. So here are my takeaways. Jesus' central role. Jesus' identification as both the eternal root and the David's descendant solidifies his central role in the biblical narrative and God's salvation plan. As believers recognize, this central position reaffirms our faith and trust in him. Then the shared mission. The collaborative call of the Spirit and the Bride underscores the shared mission of the Holy Spirit and the church in drawing people to Christ. This serves as a reminder of the believer's role in evangelism and the urgency of the gospel's message. And lastly, grace over merit. The offer of the water of life without a price is a profound reflection of God's grace. It's not about human merit, but about accepting a gift that's freely given. It's an encouragement for all, irrespective of their past, to come to Jesus and partake of this eternal life. To summarize this message, Jesus' affirmation of his identity provides a foundational truth for the believers of faith, while the universal invitation to partake of the water of life underscores God's boundless grace and the shared mission of the Spirit and the church. These verses beckon all to respond to the invitation, emphasizing that salvation, a gift beyond measure, is freely offered to all who desire it. Now we're going to move down to verses 18 through 21, the sacredness of the prophecy and Christ's assured return. Here's what it says. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book of the prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. So what we're seeing here is the guarding of the prophecy. The stern warning against adding to or taking away from the words of the prophecy underscores the sacredness and the finality of the revelation's message. This serves as a strong exhortation to approach God's word with reverence, ensuring its integrity and resisting any attempts to dilute or misrepresent it. And consequences of tampering. The dire consequences of altering the prophecy, whether by addition or subtraction, highlight the gravity of such an act. The stakes are high affecting one's eternal destiny, emphasizing the sanctity of the divine message. Then the assurance of Christ's return, the proclamation, surely I am coming soon, reemphasizes the central hope of the Christian faith, the return of Christ. The response, amen, come Lord Jesus, is a heartfelt affirmation and an eager anticipation of said promise. The benediction of grace, right? The closing blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all encapsulates the essence of the Christian message. Despite the stern warnings and revelations of judgment, the book concludes with a message of grace, hope, and inclusivity. So here are my takeaways. Reverence for the God's word. The explicit warning serves as a reminder to handle God's word with utmost care, preserving its authenticity and refraining from any form of manipulation. Then anticipation of Christ's return. The reiterated assurance of Christ's return stirs up hope and eagerness among believers. It is called to live in expectation, holding on to the promises of God. And then the primacy of grace. The concluding benediction beautifully uh, emphasizes God's grace, reminding believers of the unmerited favor and love that encompass them. It's a message of hope, comfort, and encouragement. To summarize this message found in 18 through 21, the final verses highlight the sanctity of the prophecy, the eager anticipation of Christ's return, and the prevailing grace that envelopes believers. It provides a fitting conclusion, drawing attention to the importance of preserving the integrity of God's word, the hope of Christ's imminent return, and the enduring grace available to all. So, dear listeners of Gospel Inc., As we conclude our study in Revelations 22 and the entirety of this apocalyptic book, let's pause to absorb the profound message it conveys. The book of Revelations, in all its majestic imagery and intricate symbolism, stands as a testament to God's ultimate authority and the climax of human history. It's a window into the celestial, offering glimpses of God's throne, the heavenly host, and the culmination of the age-old battle between good versus evil. Yet at the heart of this book is a dual message, one of inspiration and one of warning. The golden thread that weaves its way through the tapestry of revelations is the promise of Christ's return. It's a beacon of hope for every believer, 
an anchor for our souls in turbulent times. Surely I'm coming soon, says our Lord, reminding us to live in eager expectation and hope. In a world rife with chaos and pain and uncertainty, this promise stands as an unshakable pillar. The new Jerusalem, the tree of life, the eternal fellowship with God are not mere dreams. They are impending realities for those who trust in Christ. But just as fervently as it inspires, Revelation also issues a solemn warning. A call to repentance reverberates throughout its pages. Every seal, every trumpet, every bowl serves as a reminder that God is not indifferent to sin. The consequences of rebellion are grave. But the door to repentance remains open. The spirit and the bride say, come, will you heed that call? So as we step away from the song inspiring visions of John, let's carry with us the urgency of this message. If there's anything that the book of Revelation underscores, it's that time is of the essence. Let us not delay in seeking God's face, in turning from our ways, and in sharing this redemptive message with the world in dire need. Dear listeners, as we part ways on this series, may the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. And may we, with fervent hearts, echo the early church's cry. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you for journeying with Gospel Inc. Until next time, stay rooted in the word and let the hope of the revelations illuminate your place. God bless. So today, right, as we delve deeply into the chapter of the Bible, let our hearts be turned to the resounding echoes of divine truth and hope that transcends the ages and whispers fervently to our spirits even today. In the swirling torments of time marked by uncertainty and confusion and the shadows of persecution, let us anchor ourselves in the unshakable reality of Christ's sovereignty. He reigns supreme, his authority unyielding, and his love unfailing. Remember, he is the triumphant king who holds the keys to life and death, whose resurrection power pulses in our veins of creation, promising us victory over the grave and a gift of eternal life. As we tread these pages, right, the unfold the visions granted to John on the rugged terrains of the island of Patmos, let us not forget the context of these revelations. Patmos, a place of isolation and exile, mirrors the depths and the despair and abandonment. Yet it is here, amid the barren landscape, that the radiant light of God's presence pierces the veil of darkness, illuminating the path of hope, assurance, and eternal promises. He said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys to death and Hades. In the face of towering empires and oppressive rulers, John the Apostle of Love received the unyielding words of Christ, a message of flame with resolute courage and unyielding victory. These words breathed life and resilience into the fledging Christian community, battered by the attempts and persecutions of fear. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written, because the time is near. Let this blessing permeate over your very beings, infusing you with strength and fortitude as we navigate the pathways of our lives. May the profound words and visions of revelations fill our spirits of unwavering assurance of Christ's ultimate victory and eternal reign. In the mosaic of divine revelations, may we glimpse the celestial tapestry of God's unending love and faithfulness. Now as we close this reflection, let us carry forth the flame of hope ignited by the pleasant vision of John, allowing its light to guide our steps, dispel our fears, and deepen our unwavering allegiance to our risen Lord. I praise that our hearts may be ever strengthened, our spirits ever emboldened, and our lives ever anchored in the boundless ocean of God's eternal promises. In the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I say amen. I want to close today with a simple prayer. Please close your eyes and bow your head with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Remember, saying this prayer or any other prayer will not save you by itself. It is the genuine faith and conviction in your heart that God cares about you. The words are simply a way for you to express your faith and commitment to God. The true salvation experience comes from truly believing in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, feeling remorse for your sins, and living a life that shows commitment to the followings and teachings of Jesus Christ. 
And I just want to thank you for sharing your time with me today. If you found value in this content, I invite you to click the subscribe button. Over the next few weeks, our journey will further unfold into the chapters of Revelation. Your insights are important to me. If there's anything you disagree with or would like to share feedback on, please don't hesitate to leave a comment. In future episodes, I plan to review comments on the podcast because engaging discussion often leads to deeper understanding. And perhaps God has granted you insights into his divine promises that could enlighten us all. Wishing you a blessed and joyful week ahead.